Hello, my crafty friends. Well, this is the second uh, installment of our sheep breed study. And we're using the Dorset Horn or the Horned Dorset. Those two terms seem to be used interchangeably. Um, the person I got my fleece from called it a Horned Dorset. And um, on the um, Livestock Conservancy, they call it a Horned Dorset. Anyway, um, here's some fleece that I picked, and I'll show you how I did that in a little bit, and then we're going to card it. And here's some that hasn't been picked yet, but you can see it washed up pretty nicely. The tips are a little bit, uh, a little bit yellow, but once they, once you get the little bits of crusty stuff off of them, they whiten up pretty good. This is the lock I'm going to put in my book, in my book for a sample. Let's talk a little bit about the sheep. Um, the Dorset Horn or Horned Dorset sheep have been dubbed as the breed for all seasons and all reasons. They are highly adaptable and can be used in most sheep enterprises, such as that of the full-time commercial farming enterprises to that of the smaller farm flock operations. Horned Dorset sheep are regarded as one of the oldest and purest breeds of sheep that have that have been bred. Um, oh, sorry, that have been bred in Dorset and Somerset counties and southern on the southern coast of England for centuries. The breed has many down type characteristics, and its purity of color suggests long wool breeds. Its country of origin is the United Kingdom. It's called Dorset, Dorset Horned, or Horned Dorset, depending on where you're reading about it. It's a medium-sized breed. Its main purpose is meat, but um, it's being used more, hand spinners are using it more and more. And I don't know about commercially, if it's being used commercially or not, as wool, the wool being used commercially or not. Um, it says it, it can be used to breed for meat, for wool, or for landscape management. They are calm, docile, easy to handle, and easy to train breed of sheep. The Dorset Horn breed have a clean, open face with long bodies. Their legs are smooth and clean from the knee down. They have a compact body and a long nose, and the crown of their heads are usually well covered with wool. The ewes can breed twice a year, with around three lambings in a two-year cycle being the most common breeding program for Dorset Horn ewes. They have an excellent lambing rate and are excellent mothers and have an abundance of milk for their young. The Dorset Horn sheep provides a fine quality of wool per year. They have a fine down type wool that is dense and firm to handle. It's very popular with hand spinners. The fleece has a good staple. Um, with the compact and firm to the touch. And this is um, when you, before you pull the staples out, when they're just after they've been washed, unless they're laying, they look kind of like this. They're, you know, they are more firm and compact. Um, this one I grabbed and pulled out of some others and so it elongated it a little bit and stretched it out to, to pull it out. But you can see how this one is um, compacted. And when I pull it, it gets longer. Um, and that's just all the crimp. And I don't know if that might be a, a better sample to keep than this. I don't know. I'm going to hold on to both of them and think about it a little bit. Um, it's a medium grade wool with a spinning count of 46 to 58. So it's pretty much the same um, on the scale of fine to coarser wools. It's pretty much on the same scale as Romney. It's a, right there in the middle with Romney. Um, they're great at grazing and foraging and will keep the bush growth down. The Dorset is an ancient breed likely developed from white-faced horned um, short wooled sheep that thrived in the sheltered valleys and lush hill pastures of southwestern England. Today, the Dorset is globally distribu distributed, distributed and found in two varieties, horned and polled. 
The horned dorset is of conservation interest, and that's why I have what I have. Um, the polled dorset means it doesn't have horns. That's what polled means. Um, dorset sheep produce between five and nine pounds of medium grade wool per year. In the horn variety, both ewes and rams carry horns. Ewes horns are light, curving forward neatly. Rams horns are heavy and spiral out as well as curving forward. So here's a ram. They've got really pretty curls, don't they, in their horns? They're really pretty. <clears throat> and then here, I don't know if you can see this very well, but this is a female, and you can see her horn just curves out beside her head, but doesn't, um, doesn't turn into the big horns like the ram. Now, did I read all that? Yeah. <clears throat> Dorset horn sheep were imported to the United States about 1860, though the breed did not appear in large numbers until the 1880s. In the early 1950s, a genetic mutation caused pol causing polledness occurred in the flock at North Carolina State University. The polled Dorset variety was developed there. Polled Dorsets were also developed in Australia earlier in the 1900s, though they originated from the introduction of Corydale and Ryland blood into the Dorset horn. So they've got two different uh, ways that they managed to get a polled Dorset sheep. One was just a genetic mutation, and the other one was that they bred for it. I'm going to move this kind of out of the way so I can open this book. Here are some color pictures of Dorset sheep. And um, that ram there is a, pulled, is a horned Dorset. The other ones down here are called Dorper. They're in the Dorset, Dorset group, but they are not a Dorset breed. I mean, they're not called a Dorset. Um, it says, notice we don't call this a family. It's a group of like-named sheep, but they aren't all kissing cousins. There are essentially two breeds of sheep with, sheep with Dorset in their names. But to complicate things, these sheep have multiple names in common use. The two breeds share no close relationship, but they acquired similar names because both were developed in Dorset, a county in the southwest of England. So there's also the Dorset Down. It's one of the classic English Down breeds. And I may get to that in my breed study later, but we're not studying that sheep right now. And then you've got the... Um, the other Dorsets, okay, the Dorset Down breeds are, share a trait of having some facial color and ranging from tan to light gray with smudging on the skin. Um, the other Dorsets, which are white-faced sheep, are called Pole Dorset and Dorset Horn. They are essentially two types of the same breed, one without horns and one with. The naturally hornless polled type is re often referred to simply as Dorset. This is a matter that causes significant confusion. While the horned type is either called a dorset horn or a horned dorset. Okay. And um, so here's some more of the dorset horn sheep. And this sheep's horns are coming out in front of its ears. I mean, yeah, in the other picture, the, the horns came out behind the, the ears. The staple length for a dorset horn is two and a half to five inches. And I would say mine, um, if I don't, let me find a ruler so we can just know for sure. If I don't stretch them out, they're three inches. If I do stretch it out, it's a little over three and a half inches. So I would say this is kind of in the middle range of, dor of horn dorset fleeces. The um, fiber diameter is 26 to 33 microns, or in the Bradford scale, it's 48 to 58. The breed standard, the U.S. breed standard, calls for 26 to 32 microns. Most of the wool is white, 
and colored fibers or kemp will disqualify animals from some of the breed societies, but there are some colored dorsets. The whites are very white and will take color dyeing colors clearly. Fiber preparation and spinning tips. This is a versatile, moderate wool, amenable to carding or combing depending on length. It can also be spun from the staple. And you can see when you look at these staples that you could spin it from here pretty easy. If you kept all your staples neatly. Um, I did not wash mine trying to preserve the staples. So I could go through and, you know, get some staples um, and spin it from, this, from the staple. But um, I'm choosing not to do that. I'm going to show you here in a minute. Um, I'm going to card it and um, spin it from bats. And I may diz the bats off into roving just to make it easier. But um, you can see here, these are horn dorset samples here and here. And our horn dorset samples were silkier and had wavier crimp than the polled dorset. And also had a touch of luster. These are the polled dorset down here. It says dry sticky tips prevented good wool and preparation. With the tips removed, the worsted yarn turned out much better. And this is with the, um, all of them had a little bit of that. But since it's down here where they're saying that, I'm assuming that's where they found it was in the polled dorset. These tips are a little bit dry. But they're not breaking off, really. They just separate when you um, work at them. Okay. Get this out of the way. Sorry, I've got to find a place to put it. There we go. Okay, this is wool that I've picked. I have two baskets like this with just barely over two ounces in each basket that I've already um, that I've already picked. And what I'm doing when I say I'm picking it, I'm just um, doing this to separate the le um, locks and get any um, you know what vegetable vegetable matter I can get out out. Now there's still some vegetable matter in there. And um, even carding it probably won't take it all out. I'll still be pulling some of it out when I'm spinning. Maybe some more when I'm plying. Some extra will probably fall out when it gets washed. Um, getting every little bit of vegetable matter out of a fleece is not that easy to do. And even when you buy, um, you know, prepped fiber like from uh, Paradise Fibers or the Woolery or um, some of the independent dyers on that you can buy stuff from online you're still going to get um, little bits of vegetable matter in there that's just what it is um, even sometimes when you buy a commercially prepared yarn uh, you may get some vegetable matter when they come a lot of big commercial uh, yarn producers will do a lot of uh, they run it through acid baths and things like that to alkaline baths to get the um, <clears throat> get the vegetable matter you know to dissolve the vegetable matter and get it out of there that does damage the wool some so um, if I was going to be buying yarn um, wool yarn you know that I wanted for a precious project I would probably buy it from one of the small wool mills there's a small wool mill that I've been watching her videos and she talks about her farm where she raises her sheep and, and the mill and how she produces her yarns in the mill. And she, um, she will mill other people's um, sheep, you know, fibers too. She doesn't only do her own sheep because she doesn't have that many sheep. Um, anyway, she doesn't use those acid baths and things like that. And so that's probably where I would be buying um, buying yarn if I was buying yarn but since I like to spin I'm going to buy fleece and get rid of the um, get rid of the vegetable matter myself 
and process it myself. Um, I have bought a little bit of some processed um, roving in the Shetland from a different um, that was processed in a different mill. And uh, but you're, there's definitely still vegetable matter in it, so I know it was processed more naturally. Um, I'm going to stick this in my book because this is going to be my sample. That way I don't lose it. So there's one basket. <clears throat> Here's the other basket. <laughs> Doesn't that just look beautiful? Some quite a bit of floofy yarn. And I'm going to pick this last little bit. I saved some of it just so I could show you um, how I do it. And it's not, you know, I sat and picked all the rest of this while I was watching um, YouTube videos. Um, TV with my husband. And then we will move to carding it. Okay, you can see right here is something that I didn't get clean. Um, and it's really a, a not so great tip. Um, let me see something here. Here's a hand carter. That I can, um, okay, clean that. Okay, so now then, that's that's usable. And I've done some other um, work from fleece that I I went through it like that to um, kind of pick it out. But most of this hasn't needed that because it was um, because it washed up pretty nicely. Let me move that out of the way here. Oh goodness! <laughs> uh, sorry. Okay. I don't want to get my have my vegetable matter just fall into that comb. Um, I could probably get it to, you know, just. Um, shake it and get most of it out. But anyway, why well, add issues if you don't have to? Now, this is a second cut right here. When I encounter those, I'm just getting rid of them. And this this fleece has had some, but not, not a tremendous amount of second cuts. So the shearer did a pretty good job. I've been reading a book. Um, I'll bring it and show it to you. Um sometime in the in in the making of this video because this these um uh, breed study videos take me several days to make i make them in um in parts and put it together so anyway i'll bring the book out for y'all to to look at if you're interested at all in um the methods of um you know what goes into having a small meal and um taking care of sheep and all that kind of thing. I think it would be a book you would enjoy reading. It's called Raw Material. And um, anyway, I'll show it to you. I haven't had to work this quite this difficult and most of it that I pulled out I still got about this much same amount of fleece left in my bag, and um, <clears throat> see, there's a small um, second cut. Those will just make nips in your wool, and you're they're going to be enough nips anyway, just from the carding process. I'm not going to put stuff in there that I already know for sure is going to make nips. So I'm not. Um, so ferociously opposed to naps that I'm going to, you know, card it um, instead of, I mean, comb it instead of carding it. 
but um, but I would prefer to not have them if okay let me get my little trash can over here and And even though I've cleaned that quite a bit doing this, after I get through carding, there will be some more trash. Um, okay, I'm going to move these. But what I've tried to do here is split my wool up into two amounts. And I'm going to make... Um, <clears throat> I may end up making two bats for each one. We'll see. It depends on how it does on the carding, on the um, drum carter. But I want to keep them separate so because they weigh the same amount. And that way I can do a um, I can do a two ply yarn and from this point on I don't have to worry about um, am I getting it even because we started out with an even amount. And this is probably two and a quarter ounces in each box. Um, it might be a little bit less than that, but that's what I started out with before I started working with it. Was two and a half ounces in each box. Okay, I'm going to pause the camera and get set up to with the drum carter. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just put this down in there, and I'm going to do it, you know, kind of um, lightly. I don't want to um, try to cram it in there. And I did clean my drum carter off with a brush the best that I could. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't really want it to come over the edge. And I'm just letting the fibers pull um, to kind of straighten themselves out. Okay. And now then I'm just going to kind of brush it down a little bit and grab some more. And we'll just see how much of this we can get on here. Some kinds of wool, um, the bouncier kinds, you can't get as much as you can. Something that um, doesn't have as much elasticity. Okay, I'm not going to pull every little bit out, but sometimes when I see a, a piece that's big and obvious, I'm going to go ahead and stop and pull it out now because some of those tips were still kind of dirty this um, the yarn that I make with this will be cleaner um, once it's been spun and washed than it you know than it will be before it's washed so But it's um, it's doing it's pretty white. It's good. I'm doing my breed studies um, in natural colors. Once the breed study is completely finished, I might decide that I want to dye some of these, um, over dye some of them, and see, you know, 
um, how they take dye. That might be another um, <laughs> another study, but for right now, I'm um, for right now I'm gonna spin them raw fibers because every step you do everything you do to it changes the um, the feel of the fiber and dyeing it changes it some and um, I want to I want to see what it's like to spin you know in its most as natural a form as I can without spinning it in the grease or from the locks that doesn't mean I won't spin any of these breeds from the locks um, I would I will probably spin Winsleydale from the locks when I do that breed because it's a um, a long wool breed and it's it's long silky locks are part of its charm um, okay I'm definitely gonna have to do more than one bat for um, for each ply of the yarn because I can already see this is in places it's getting kind of full and um, there's no reason to overload it when I can just do two smaller ones. And that's what happens when you um, when you get it kind of all in the same spot. See, right here in the center, there's a lot of, um, ooh, look at that. There's a lot of wool in the center, and I was trying to keep from um, doing the edges too much because I didn't want to. Uh, let's try going just a little bit right down the side here. Now each of these bats I will card at least twice and maybe three times. I'm not sure. I'm just going to make one of them with you and then um, I'll do the the rest of them later and show them, you know, off camera so the video doesn't get too long. Another way you can do this, and I haven't tried to do it with fleece, but you can you kind of paint it on so you can fill up spots that are um, you know thinner that seems to be working pretty good actually okay well, let's do a little over here paint on silk and I've painted on some colored tops and things that were add-ins but I haven't ever <laughs> haven't ever painted on fleece okay all right I think I'm gonna go a little bit more let's just go ahead and do this And I'm going to add a little bit more there, and then we're going to call this um, 
good, even though I don't really think that's quite half of it, but we will see. Okay, we're going to stop right here. And then we're going to pull this bat off. Okay, well here's our bat. And I don't know what that bat weighs, but it's pretty puffy. Um, so that was, it was a good choice to stop there. Okay, I'm going to um, end this segment of the video and we'll come back when we're... Um, showing how we prep the bats to use okay this was my second um time through the drum carter i thought i would take it off again and then i would show you how i do it the second and third time so you would have an idea of that before we get to the um how to spin it <laughs> and different people do this different ways so um just because this is the way I do it doesn't mean it's necessarily the right way. I try to get off, you know, as much of it as I can. If I was moving to a different fiber, then I would be even more picky about it. But um, here's the second pass, and it's much smoother. But for the third pass, I'm going to do exactly what I, oops, <laughs> well, <laughs> don't set it down on top of this. <laughs> I'm going to pull it into thirds. And... Um, and then with each one of these thirds, I'm going to attenuate it like I would if I was pre-drafting to spin, just a little bit. And it's already a nice prep. It would already be a good prep to spin. But, um, but then I'm going to spread it out a little bit. Like this. And then I'm going to um, put it through the drum carter again. So when I take it off this time, it will be um, the final preparation. And then I will um, decide if I want to put it through a diz and make um, 
roving or if I, that was a sl uh, short second cuts that would have made a problem so I just went in and took them out um, or if I want to just pull off chunks and spin it from the chunk typically I do diz it off um, but I usually have a lot of inclusions and stuff going on and it's not just one fiber and so I don't know that it's as necessary to put it through the diz if you're just doing one fiber but it does uh, make it a a narrower preparation to work with you can see how this might be you know a little more difficult to work with this feels nice so far I'm very happy with this um, this fleece and I think it's gonna make nice yarn And I've got my hand right here just to um, resist a little bit so that it pulls on with this. And that just keeps this brush cleaner for me. Um, this is a old drum carter, so it may have issues that newer drum carters don't have, and you may not need to do that with a newer drum carter. Um, It's still catching on my liquor in brush, but it takes some, um, what do you call it trial and error to figure out what works the best with the drum carter that you have okay I think I'm gonna be better off right now to do this Some drum carters have a brush that fits across here that helps. Um, mine doesn't, which is why I have this brush. But I usually do it after I've got my stuff on there and not, um, I can't hold it in place and turn slowly. I mean, um anyway it works better for me to do it after the fact i guess that's what i'm saying okay and this is the third piece i i depending on how fat they are and how many inclusions there are i split my bats into three or four pieces when i'm recarding He's just determined to stay in there. Okay, I'm not going to worry about it. What works best also changes with what fibers you're using so um, it's like a constantly learning new things new better ways to do things sorry for the squeaky this is the only table I have that I can get a camera 
um, my camera to work with. And so, um, well, and still be out here in the quiet. <laughs> so you have to listen to this squeaky. There's the third pass, and I've got this is one bat. I've got two bats for each um, ply that I'm doing. And I'm only doing a two ply, so. Okay, here's the third pass, and it's um, it's very nice. All right, well, that's it for this segment, and when I get these ready to spin, I'll show you what I decide to do with them, whether I'm just going to split it or whether I'm going to run it through a diz at that time. Okay, I ended up with four bags that look pretty much like this. Um, after I did the second one a second time, I looked at it and compared it to the first one that I had done three times, and I could not really tell any difference. Um, so I did the other three twice, and then I mixed them up and put them um, out and looked at them again and had Hannah look at them, and neither one of us could tell which um which was the one I had done three times. So I decided the, excuse me, I'm trying to get that piece off. I decided the um, the other three were just going to go the two times. Because sometimes you run the risk, if you put it through more times, of developing um, some slubs and some nips that you might not have had if you had stopped. So anyway, so this is what the bats look like. Let me move this out of the way. And I made four of them, and um, so I divided them up into two batches, and they're just a little bit over, they're like um, 2.26 or something like that ounces for the set. So this is a, just a little over one ounce of fiber. Now, when I was measuring them out to make sure that I had, um, in my two different sets, that I had the same amount of fiber, I had to pull this much off of one set and put it to the other one in order to make them the same weight. And after I did that, I thought, you know, I, I didn't sample before I decided how I was going to spin the Romney. And I really wanted to do that. I just totally forgot and did what I normally do instead of sampling. And so, um, so I said, I'm just going to use this to sample. But I wasn't sure it would be enough. So I took off. A little bit more and you can see this is a tiny bit more than this um, but taking this one away from one set and taking this one off the other set made them pretty close they're like within you know um, a tenth of an ounce or something um, maybe actually a um, hundredth a couple of hundredths of an ounce so it's, it's not a big deal to have done that but then I've got this much I can play with and do some samples um, after I've decided how I'm going to do that, I mean, how I'm going to um, spin it, I will also take this bat and divide it up and show you how I'm going to do that. But right now, I'm just going to set that aside. And um, we're going to use these two pieces to do our samples. And I haven't done any spinning with this fiber yet, so... The first thing I'm going to do is just, um, well, let's 
make sure it's I can't remember if this was a a bobbin that I had plied on or just spun on it looks like it was just spun on so it should be fine um I'm just going to do my, my default or what's been my default since I got this um, e-spinner which is fairly fine and um, and I'm just going to pull out like I normally do and this is pulling a little bit maybe a little bit thicker than my default and that may just be the way that this um, wants to spin so if it is that's okay that's how I'll spin it because I don't want to fight with it and try to force it thinner um, so I'm just kind of playing with it here a little bit see if it's yeah it's kind of sticking right around this same well now it's a little thinner Okay, let's pull this off. And I'm going to go here and create a, um, a two-ply yarn, spinning it just like that. Let's control that twist there while I'm doing this. Okay, so this is my default two-ply yarn, and I don't know how well you can see um, what that looks like. It'll probably be better if you can, um, if we can have something to gauge it against, so I have plenty here. Ah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> see if we can get this to become a three-ply. Okay, so this is a three-ply, this is a two-ply, and this is what it looks like with the, um, with the amount of twist that I put into it and just letting it ply back on itself. So this isn't... Um, sometimes you can manipulate things a little bit by adding extra twist in the ply, but this doesn't have that. So um, I can look at this and see right away that the three ply seems to be um, woolier and looser, but I don't know if that's because of the way I was um, spinning at that moment, you know. Okay, we've still got plenty here, so let's Let's do another three ply and see if we can. See if it, how it matches that one. Okay, so here's my two three plies and my two ply, and it still looks woolier. Okay, um, that's fine. Let's do another two ply since we've got a little bit more yarn here. Ooh, we don't have much. We don't have much. Okay. Well, that didn't hardly do, wasn't hardly enough, but it's, it's definitely, um, that's funny. Okay, that,
didn't really give me the information that I wanted. So I'm going to, um, we're going to leave these sitting here. And um, and I'm going to do, do some more. And see if um, if my spinning just changed during that, or <laughs> okay. Definitely have some slubs in this. This time I'm I'm actually um, you, doing it worsted, all of it instead of um, I was doing some worsted and some kind of a semi worsted as far as the um, spinning goes. So we're gonna see if we do enough for a two ply and a three ply, and that was kind of thick. See, I've, <laughs> I pull, I usually pull off slubs like that when I'm in the middle of spinning, but um, I was hoping to get a, this little piece was on the edge and it's just not quite as smooth, maybe as, um, wait, let's go ahead and, if you don't let it go ahead and take it on, it um, I'm sorry I lost my train of thought if you don't let it go ahead and take it on you don't get as much twist in it as you would have if you pulled it off the bobbin Okay, this is a nicer two-ply sample than my first one because the first one was um, kind of thick and thin and all that. So I'm going to put it here and I'm going to do um, a three-ply. Is you need to tell I don't make three ply samples very often because I'm letting it move and it's so it's coming unplied. That's what's happening. I'm, I mean, this third one comes unspun. Okay, I'm not happy with that. Let's try again. Ooh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes you can roll it a little bit and um, make it look like more like what it really will look like. So. So this is another three ply. Um, these were done when it was kind of sort of worsted and sort of woolen. This was a worsted spin with a woolen prep. A two ply and a three ply. Um, 
I think my three ply will not be as woolly as this if I'm not folding it back and forth to get my sample. Um, so I'm really kind of looking at the twist angle and the, um, the thickness of the yarn trying to decide. And I don't think, I think I'm happy so far with, um, with it as a two-ply. Okay, let me get this off here. Because that's not useful to me. Okay, first let's get it back on the spinning wheel. It does make a difference <laughs> if you have your spinning wheel threaded or not. Okay, I'm going to leave that and start with this one because it's bigger. And I'm going to try to do a bigger yarn just for kicks and see. what a bigger yarn would be like. And I am still doing my just my default um, worsted short forward draw spin. I'm just adding more um, fibers in. And it really does not want to spin this thick. I guess it could. It may just be because I'm not used to doing it. Maybe if I did it quite a while it would feel more normal. I don't know. But it feels like this um, really liked spinning that thinner yarn that I did earlier. Okay. Okay, Whew. that is very strong. <laughs> okay, with the heavier, um, you know, pulling more fibers in at a time, I did get a heavier yarn. And uh, see, that's a two ply. Okay, let's do it like this. These are both two plies. And let's see what a three ply of that yarn will be like. And I'm going to have to cut it. I'm not... I don't want any of that twist to come out of it while I'm working on it so that's why I go ahead and tie a knot up there okay here's the three ply and here's the two ply of the fatter yarn come on they don't take up a whole lot less space when you look at them like this but when you're, um, if you wrap them, they take up a different amount of space. The two on the outside are the three-ply. The two on the inside are the two-ply. Come on. Um, because there's just more density in the one with three plies, even though they don't take up a whole lot different space. So here's... Two plies and three plies. Whoo, come on. Come back. Sorry. Oh, goodness gracious. 
See if I can get it to focus again down here. Come on. There you go. All right. Now I turned off autofocus. I wanted the autofocus on so you could see that. Um, I think I'm probably going to spin it like this. Just my default two-ply. Because I really like that. And um, this was the thicker was definitely harder for me to um, harder for me to try to spin. So, okay, so we figured that out. There's just some bonus bits, <laughs> but I'm not going to keep those. And um, okay. Let me get this off. This makes a pretty um, a pretty nice yarn, fat, but it was much harder for me to spin fat. So, um, so we're going to not worry about that. I'm going to call that our little spinning experiment for now. And I'm going to save those samples. And then um, I'll, I'll add that back in somewhere. Okay, now then, how to... How to turn the bat into something we want to spin. I think I am going to diz it. I first thought I would just split it. And um, I'll show you how to do that. You just take it and pull it apart. And you can just pull it apart like this and spin it. Or you can um, start here and go back. And then you kind of work with this to make it into a, a long piece of roving. But I don't like those turns. They always end up making things harder for me rather than easier. So I'm just going to strip it into pieces like this. And I guess um, so I have four pieces now. Five. And that one's very thick compared to the other ones. So let's go ahead and split it down. Now I have six pieces, and they would all spin fine, just like this, but um, I don't, this is um, just a little bit bigger than how I usually, what I usually diz it off, but I think I want to diz it smaller this time just for fun, because I haven't done that in a long time, so let me grab something to use as a diz, and I'll be right back. Okay, I found this button, and one thing I like about it is that it's a little bit concave, and I like something that's concave, but these holes are smaller than what I've used in the past. So I'm thinking this might be what I want. Um, we're going to just practice with this here. The hardest part of dizzing off is getting your fiber to go through the hole. Once you do that, you kind of... You're doing good. Okay, let me move those up out of the way. So kind of what you do is you hold on to this and you pull forward. Um, okay, now this is kind of how it's dizzing off. That will be a breeze to spin. I'm kind of doing this backwards from how I usually do it. I'm not sure why, but it, that helps me <laughs> helped me figure out why I was having so much trouble getting it to work. Because I'm doing it backwards. Anyway, doesn't matter. You can do it either way. Just 
tuck this right in there. Okay, so we've got this little um, pile here. Let me get that to kind of a little bird's nest. And let's just see how that spins so I'll know if I really want to go to that much trouble because that takes a, it'll take a lot longer to diz that off than... Um, Okay, let's do this. We're going to... Okay, we're going to spin this much of it like this. And then... This much of it I'm going to turn back into a bigger roving and we'll spin from that. And we will see um, if it really makes much difference or not as far as my spinning goes, to spin from something bigger or something that's been dizzed. Okay, let's start with this. Uh-oh, wasn't around my hook. There we go. Oh, turn it off. Got to turn it back on. And I'm just, just spinning, don't have a lot to say, just kind of watching how, how it feels in my hands, how easy it is to, you know, move those fibers over into the place where I want to spin them. And this is not difficult to spin. That's the way I've been spinning that for a long time from a preparation that's about this thick. You do have to kind of move your fiber around and so that you can, you know, get from the different parts of the preparation. And when I get through um, with these two samples here, um, I'll let you know whether I've decided to diz it or to do straight from the stripped pieces, but um, and whether I've decided I want it dizzed this small or if I want to go back to something like I usually diz with, which is about twice this big. And when you get slubs like that, you can break those off. You don't have to keep them. Sometimes when I'm doing my real yarn, I'm, I'm better about pulling the slubs off a lot of the time. Now, sometimes I'm not. Sometimes I don't, you know, I'm 
looking for, I don't mind a text, more textured yarn. Okay, now we're going to go to this smaller prep. I think it does make it a little easier to have it um, my roving um, smaller because I don't have to go back and forth or you know from the top to the bottom of that other wider preparation I don't know that it affects the yarn any but um, it probably does affect it to some degree because I'm not having to struggle to you know get the move back and forth across my roving but um, See, one thing for sure, this is not letting me um, pull slubs out as easily as that Romney did. That Romney, I could just pull slubs out all day long. It did not, you know, my roving never, it never broke. My string yarn, whatever, never broke when I did that. But this time, this one's not, which means it probably needs more twist. So I need to, <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> either add more tension or um, speed up my <coughs> my spinning wheel okay um, I'm gonna I think I'm gonna tighten my tension a little bit and let's do the rest of this and then we're gonna go back and um, do a plyback test and see Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's go ahead and Okay, look how loose that is. <coughs> that definitely did not have enough twist or enough tension in it. So Excuse me. So now I know I'm going to have to, um, let's see what my speed is. Oh, my speed got knocked down. Okay, that's probably what it was. Because it's definitely not acting like it did before. Um, <laughs> yeah, see that's, luckily this was a sample, my sample yarn, so it doesn't really matter. I can just pull it off into a pretty mess. <laughs> okay, I'm going to, um, now that I've fixed my speed, I'm going to go ahead and spin this. Uh, I think I probably will go ahead and diz it through this just for fun because I haven't done, um, I haven't never dizzed it that small. And um, that's this whole thing, you know, this whole breed study is to learn more about the wool and to, you know, teach me things. So this one will also teach me whether I like it this, this small better than the way I usually do it. So we'll, we'll see. Uh, when I get it all spun and I'm ready to apply it, I'll come back and show you the, um, 
the bob excuse me the bobbins and how i apply it um looking at these I'm thinking I'm going to just go ahead and spin it a two-ply, the small two-ply, which is this one. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll be back later. Okay, this is all I have left to spin. And i um, trying to find where the, there it is, where the end is. I did go ahead and pull it through a disc. And I used that small button that I um, showed y'all earlier. And um, this is what's left to spin. I have one bobbin here and then this bobbin that's almost almost full. And so um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to spin this last little bit and then and then we will um, let's see let's take that little bit off it got compressed somehow. Looked like it wanted to make a nib right off the bat. We don't want to do that. So, um, anyway, I just thought I'd talk a little bit about spinning this fiber. It is, um, it is a nice breed to spin. I've enjoyed it. It spins really easy. And, um, I think putting it in the drum carter and making batch out of it was the right thing to do. It spins almost like top. It it really does. It it even looks, you know, the fibers look pretty much like they're all going the same direction. But it is a it is a um, you know a roving really. But I am spinning it um, in a worsted manner with a short forward draw and um, it's easy to spin this way and this way it's just spinning you know the width it wants to spin so I'm just letting it do its thing One thing about spinning the plain fiber is that you can actually see it um, across this messy um, cardboard here I've got here. Some Sometimes if I was spinning something darker, it wouldn't show up as much. And the same thing if I was spinning on a white, you know, sometimes I, I spin darker fibers, I put a white cloth underneath. That helps me to see it better and it helps y'all to see it better but um, when you're spinning on a natural um, cream colored fiber you don't have to do that it, it's pretty obvious it shows up pretty good this prep has been um, a pleasure to spin it this whole thing I'll definitely buy an, um, another horn dorset fleece at some time Next time I'll buy a whole fleece. This time I just bought one pound because I was doing it for the um, shave them to save them. Um, challenge. I couldn't think of that word challenge. It was not coming. And um, this is the first breed that I've done for that challenge. And I'm kind of mixing that challenge in with my breed study so that the um so i'll you know do a breed study on this all of the breeds that i do in the challenge and um, there will also be other breeds in the study that are not part of the um not part of the uh, shave them to save them challenge um i'm really liking the um the, it's it's spinning pretty smooth. I guess is what I'm trying to say. There are little naps and things in it, but but not very many. It um, it really prepared up nice and easy. It washed up nice and easy. Um, and I've seen other people say they really love to spin horn dorset. So I can fully understand where they're coming from because it's a 
it's very nice. And I don't know what the yarn will be like. Um, if it'll be, you know, how soft it will be or what I'll use it for. Because it does make a difference. If it's not very soft, you don't want to make a scarf or something out of it. Um, but one thing I've learned um, while I've been learning to spin is that all wool can be used for something. Um, you can, if you don't really like it, you know, it's still good to put into tapestries, um, things like that. If, you know, even the really icky feeling wool is good for that. So, but this, this doesn't feel bad. It's not as soft as a merino or targi or something like that, but it's, it's nice. And I'm not sure at this point exactly how much weight my yarn will be, but um, it'll it'll be. I started with um, probably seven or I'm not sure. I washed the whole pound and then I just pulled a bunch of it out, and made sure it was over four ounces. Although, the, for the shave them to save them thing, you can start with four ounces of fleece and, um, and work from that if you're working from raw fleece. But I wanted, I wanted to make sure I got four ounces of yarn from this. Uh, some of the ones that I'm doing in the breed study, the ones that are for the shave them to save them challenge, some of those I started with four or five ounces of fleece, so I will not get four ounces of yarn out of it um, because you do have a lot of waste when you start from a fleece but that's okay it's um, I don't have a specific project in mind for these yarns I'm probably going to put them all together and do something with them all together the breed study or the shave them to save them yarns I may use them all to do something for the shave them to save them challenge um, since I started with the fleece, spinning yarn from it is um, is enough to be considered a project. I don't have to knit with it. And they do that because you've got some people who don't spin and they just want to knit. And so um, they can buy four ounces of yarn and knit something, you know, and they've done a project. Just like someone who buys four ounces of fleece and spins yarn, they've made yarn, so they've made a project. So um, they make it as easy as they can for as many people to be involved as possible, which I think is wonderful. This is, um, it feels a little slick when I'm spinning it. Um, it reminds me a little bit of Romney that way. It slides out of the preparation really easily. And um, that's not, it's not so slick that it's a problem, but... Um, it's amazing how different wools feel through your fingers when you're when you're drafting and when you're spinning. They all feel different. Some of them are much easier, more pleasant to work with than others. I enjoyed the Romney that we did in the last breed study video, and I'm really enjoying the Horn Dorset as well. I'm glad that I've got enough fiber left. I can do do it again. <laughs> um, you know, for another, I can make another skein of yarn later. But I'm going to move on to other things before I do that. That's just, it'll be there waiting when I'm ready to do another. Another one. That's one nice thing about fleece. If you wash it and store it properly, it'll still be there even if you wait a few years. <laughs> okay, let's see if I need to change where my... Yeah. I don't have much left to spin, so it's not like it's a big deal to change it right at this point, but...
can't wait to see what kind of yarn it makes. My plan to do the um, the breed study yarns all natural colors, and um, I'll decide when I'm finished with um, you know getting doing them all if I want to dye them and do them in a project together or um, what I'm going to do because I'll have a lot of different different colors and different um, amounts of yarn for for the different breeds so it's not like I'm going to have four ounces of yarn from every breed so but um, that's what happens when you start with um, with fleece because different breeds end up with more waste you know some more have more waste than others and I could have I didn't because like with this one I started out with a lot more than with more than four ounces um, even to you know to spin so but you could take four ounces and this if I thought about it I might have done it this way four ounces of each kind of fleece and see how much waste there is how much yardage you get all of that kind of thing from the different fleeces that would have been a good thing to have in your breed study as well but uh, I didn't think of that until just now okay So now I'm going to take this off. And I'm going to move it over here onto my Lazy Kate. And this elastic right here puts a little bit of tension on the bobbin. If I get it in the right place. <laughs> so that it doesn't run away from you and then we're going to put a fresh bobbin on and I just plied a different deal of yarn a few minutes ago so um, so this this um, leader will have to be charged because it's not it is not going the right direction Okay, bring this back here. Put the drive band back on. Can't do anything without that. Okay. Now I'm going to switch my um, machine over to an uh, S-twist. Let's do it a little bit more. Okay, if you don't do this, and you don't have this um, spinning in the right, you know, twist in the right direction, then when you go to um, to ply your yarns, your the twist will just come out of your yarn and go up into this. And when that happens, then the first part of your yarn won't have the integrity that you want it to have. And what I do is one, two, three, load. One, two, three, load. One, two, three, load. And I try to keep pretty much that same pace through the whole thing so it will all be plied pretty much the same. 
Um, I don't do it perfectly because I don't count through the whole thing. I just kind of get myself going and then, and um, every once in a while I stop and count for a minute, you know, to make sure I'm still doing it about right. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, one, two, three. I'm going to move this over a little bit because I want to load my bobbin um, as evenly as possible. And when I get, um, get one layer on the bobbin, I'll stop and let y'all look at it before before I do finish the rest of the um, the plying, I'll finish the rest of the plying off camera. And then I'll come back and I'll show you the yarn um, when it's finished. Before I actually finish the yarn, though, I will um, put it in a skein and measure it. And then I'll, um, then I'll finish it and then I'll measure it again so we can see kind of an approximation of how much the yarn shrank between being spun and plied and then um, being washed so it's amazing to me some of them don't seem to shrink at all they have no elasticity and others have a lot of elasticity and so they shrink back quite a bit so it just um, depends on the nature of the fibers I think this is going to be a pretty yarn. It feels nice running through my fingers as I'm plying it. Even with the little bumps that get in there. Plying is faster than spinning um, because before you get to the plying stage, you've spun two bobbins worth and then you're putting the two together. So it takes about half as long to ply as it does to spin. Um, maybe it's even faster than that, really, because I can ply it in a couple of hours and it takes me several hours to spin each ply. So um, plying is quite a bit faster. Usually, I enjoy spinning better, more with colored fibers um, because the, I like the color and texture um, combination. And so I don't, I don't spin a whole lot of um, natural fiber unless it's a colored wool. I don't spin a whole lot of the cream natural fibers, maybe I should say. So it's, it's, it's nice to do some, you know, do this where it's different. And um, you can really enjoy the nature of the fiber itself and the, um, the texture of the, just the yarn. And instead of um, letting the color, you know, be most of what you see. So I'm enjoying this for a change since I don't do it very often. It's kind of like... Um, the difference between black and white photos and colored photos. The black and white photos have a different, um, you, you notice things in those that you don't notice because the color is what captures your attention in a color photograph. And um, so it's kind of the same thing if you're a photographer or if you like to work with, you know, colored images versus um, black and white images. Um,
Oh, okay, let me stop that for a second. I'm over spinning it trying to get that one piece off. So let's back up a bit. Okay. It's funny how you, you make choices when you're spinning and when you're plying. Um, and some things you let go by and they don't bother you. And then something else, you just want to pull it off and get it out of there. And um, It's one of those things. Everybody makes different choices. I've had a couple of really, really thin spots that end up making little piggy tails up here. I noticed... That was two, the second one, just a minute ago. Um, that's not something that I have to deal with a lot. But um, it does happen sometimes if you get a really, really small spot, it, it folds up on itself before it gets plied. I hope y'all are enjoying the breed studies. Um, I'm enjoying doing them. I'm enjoying learning about the different breeds and what you can do with their fibers. Um, I'm also enjoying the fact that they all spin a little different and they feel different in your hand and um, they look different. Um, so that's fun. Instead of spinning the same thing all the time, it's nice to do um you know, to do different things, and then I can have different ideas, maybe of what kind of fleece I want to buy in the future, because of all these little bits of fleece that I've been working on. Um, by the time I get finished, I will have worked on a bunch of them anyway. This is the only the second one so far. I do have a playlist. If um, if you missed the Romney one, you can go back and and find it and then all the future breeds will be on that in that same playlist um, doing the uh, save them to shave them breeds as well as the breeds that are not on the conservatory list all in the same playlist um, in my Romney um, video in the description box I put the shave them to save them and the um, livestock conservancy website I put both of those links in there I'll try to remember to stick that in the description box of this video as well um, even though the Romney wasn't on that list I just wanted you to see where I'm finding fleece and um, okay sorry Okay, even though this was a really nice fleece to work with, I'm still finding vegetable matter as I go. You find it when you spin, you find it when you ply, probably find it when you're working with it um, to crochet or knit or weave or whatever you do with it, you'll find some more then. <laughs> We're getting close to having a, a layer on the bobbin so I can bring it over here and show you and then I won't, I won't make you watch any more plying after that. Next time you see me, we'll be looking at the finished skein of yarn. I have, um, no, I've seen a lot of people talk about spinning sock yarn for this. And so, um, I may, when I do do the horn dorset again, I may use a, do a three ply and try to, make a sock yarn out of it. I, I don't knit, so I'll have to crochet my socks, but I do want to try that. And I know that um, I've seen people say they that they do knit socks with a two-ply yarn but they're not as strong as a three-ply yarn, so 
If I'm going to go to that much trouble, I probably won't knit mine though. I'll crochet them. But if I'm going to go to that much trouble, I'll probably do it with a three ply yarn. Because I can weave and crochet other things with two ply yarns just fine. Okay. I had to stop and turn on the air conditioner. I had it on economy and it wasn't enough. <laughs> Okay, let's... Put that right there. And bring this over here closer. So you can see, let's zoom in a little bit. I think it's the light that's making it. There is some uh, a little bit of a halo on the yarn, and that um, makes it a little harder for y'all to see it too. I'm really trying to get it to focus better. I guess that's all it's going to do. Let's bring you down a little bit and see if. There we go. Anyway, that's what it looks like so far, and I'll finish plying it and. Get it all ready to go, and I'll show you that. Be back after we get that done. Okay, here's my final um, skein of yarn from the Horned Dorset. Um, this is the the passport from this Shave 'em to Save 'em um, project, and I got this fleece from Three Creeks Farm on Etsy, and it's been a lovely fleece. I have completely enjoyed working with it. It was easy to wash. It was easy to card, um, to flick and put on the, the carter. There was very little waste. And um, it was easy to spin. I really enjoyed it. Um, I do want to show you uh, in my book. Um, where I've written some stuff down here. Let's back out a little bit. Okay, this is where I've written my information and I'm still um, deciding what information I want to keep on these pages and what I don't. Um, this is a a sample that I crocheted. It crocheted up very nicely and it was very easy to crochet. I didn't have any trouble with it at all, even just as a two ply. It, um, it does have a little bit of a halo on it, which gives it a little bit softer look, but it's still got good stitch definition. I haven't washed, um, 
you know, washed and blocked this sample. It's just the sample. And I didn't try pulling, you know, um, I guess they call it frogging, pulling the yarn back out um, to see if how difficult it would be to do that. So I don't know about that. But I do know that when I wove it on my little loom, let me get my little loom here. When I wove a sample on my little loom, and then I went to, to pull the edges in, in the, the last one, I was able to, um, to make the edges look nice and neat with the Romney. But with this, when I was using a needle to, um, to you know, go under and over, under and over, um, it was evidently catching just one little bit of fiber here and there. It never looked like it was, but obviously it was because when I went to try to pull these to neaten it up, it would not work. And um, rather than making another sample and trying again, I decided just to leave it messy like this because um, that way I'll remember that this is a, it might make a pretty sticky warp as far as, um, you know, not just gliding, but um, it's also pretty strong. So I think it would be fine as a warp yarn or a weft yarn. But this makes me wonder if uh, if it was knitted or crocheted and you happen to catch just a little bit of that. I don't know if you can see. Um, there's just little fibers. Let me get something dark to put under it so you can see the you can see the little fibers sticking out there those little fibers um, I think you just have to catch some of that and it makes it it might make it hard to um, if you had to go back and you know fix something that might be difficult I don't know I haven't tried it but I did wonder about it um, I have a little bit left I guess I could crochet a bit and then pull it out and see what happens but I haven't done that I got 16 wraps to the inch on my card. Um, I think, honestly, it's probably more like 17, maybe 18 even, because this is not quite an inch. Um, but I'm, I, I, feel, I really enjoyed this. This is definitely a fleece I would buy again, and um, I'm looking forward to working with it again. I know there will be some, when I'm doing this um, breed study, there will be some breeds I probably won't want to buy again. But this is one I would definitely, definitely buy again. And I would happily buy more from Three Creeks Farm. Um, it was beautiful fiber. And it was, um, it cleaned up really pretty easy. So, uh, that is... That is my Horned Dorset breed study. If you have any questions that I didn't answer, um, I was not given the name of the sheep that this one came off of. Um, it would have been nice to know. That's, I think that's fun, but, but I don't know. So, um, Three Creeks Farm, if you're watching, <laughs> you, might, you might tell people the name of your sheep if you get the name. I don't know if, if these are your, you know, if this was your sheep or... Um, or not, but, um, but it was lovely to work with. God bless you all. Bye-bye.